we were under a lot of pressure because um, there were all these industrial looms setting up in places like New Lanark. Oh, sorry, that's my own phone. No, can't complain about this. Right. Whoa, sorry about that. Um, yes, they, um, yeah, they got a 25% cut in their wages in um, the 1780s. And this led, a seven, uh, in 1787, it became the first organized strike in UK history. Now, this was a handloom weavers, and it went on all summer. They were, um, in, in Cal mainly Calton and they were um, burning looms of strike breakers, um, destroying cloth that was made, and there was some violence. Initially, there had been a letter going out saying there would be no violence um, when they were first threatening their strike. But, um, of course, things happen. So, um, in September, the Lord Provost of Glasgow said he would meet with them, and they brought along the local sheriff, and um, they met the strikers in um, Drygate Brewery, which is, beside, well, basically the local, like, the present-day tenants' brewery in Denison, in present-day Denison. He met them there, um, about 7,000 strikers, and just to be safe, um, he brought along with him soldiers from the 39th East Middlesex Regiment of Foot. So, um, it's not clear whether the Riot Act was read first. Before there was any firing, officially, the Riot Act was supposed to be read <coughs> to allow the people to disperse. And the strikers claimed it had never been read. The sheriff and the Lord Provost said it had been read, but what's not in dispute is that the, the soldiers opened fire on the unarmed strikers and shot dead six of them and wounded a whole lot more, who we don't know how many, because, of course, the wounded had to be huckled away into hiding since the, the soldiers followed it up with a house-to-house -house search looking for any trace of the rebels. So um, that was in 1787. Um, in 1790, 1792, sorry, the second part of Thomas, Tain, Thomas Paine's book, The Rights of Man, was published. Now, this was a very radical book because it was putting forward the, the idea that the people had the right to rise up against a government which was not protecting them. And, and he was therefore justifying the French Revolution that was going on at the time. Now, at first, Thomas Paine's book, the, the sales were quite sluggish. But then Henry Dundas came into the equation. Now, these days, Henry Dundas is mainly known as the person who um, delayed the abolition of slavery by um, bringing in the word gradually into the, the laws abolishing slavery. Um, and that was a bit later. But um, th much earlier than this, he was known as the uncrowned King of Scotland. He had virtually every position of authority in Scotland, and if he didn't have it, his relations had it, and his friends and cronies had it. Um, th this was a time when the, the Parliament down in London didn't really pay any attention to Scotland. I think since the Union, they'd only passed four laws that even affected Scotland. So Henry Dundas was um, bestriding Scotland like a colossus, and he decided that Thomas Paine's book was wicked and seditious, and he banned it, and he said nobody was to print it or, or buy it or sell it, and it was a public duty to report anybody who saw anybody printing or buying or selling this wicked and seditious book. Well, what do you think happens to a banned book? The sales absolutely shot up. It sold like hot cakes. It was translated into Gaelic, and it was um, spread all over the highlands and the lowlands of Scotland. And... Um, this morphed into a frenzy of, um, of agitation where they were burning Henry Dundas in, in effigy, um, bur burning him all over Scotland and also planting liberty trees, which were the symbol of the French Revolution, all over Scotland. The French Revolution um, was a, an inspiration to all these, 
all this unrest and everything, as, as was the American Revolution that had happened a couple, uh, 20 years before. So more unrest came um, more or less immediately afterward. Anti-conscription riots, sorry. Um, yeah, pointing it the right way now. Um, yes, in, um, the, the brought in conscription into the army in England in 1759, but they'd never dared to bring it into either Scotland or obviously Ireland. Um, this was because they were scared of arming the population in these, in these places. The Lord Provost of Glasgow said it would be dangerous to put arms in the hands of the fanatics. Can you hear me? Right. Yeah. Um, and he also said it would be highly improper to trust arms in the hands of the lower classes of people here and in Paisley. Paisley was an absolute byword for revolution. But the wars with the revolution, they were really very much in need of soldiers. It wasn't just for the wars that were going on in France. It was because of all the unrest in the street. They needed people in, in for street duty soldiers. And of course, this didn't make conscription any more popular in Scotland because people realised that the uh, guys that were drafted in would have to turn their weapons against their own friends and, and neighbours. So the anti-conscription riots ranged from Berwickshire to Highland Perthshire and Dumfriesshire to Aberdeenshire. There was even a castle was stormed and the Duke of Arthur, Athol and um, another Duke, I forget which Duke it was, were, were taken prisoner for a wee while, so it, it was just kind of all over the place. Largely led by women, these anti-conscription riots. And in fact, um, yeah, here we see, this is one of the women. Um, the, the bloodiest event of all in the anti-conscription riots was the massacre of Trenent. Um, Trenent being a wee town in East Lothian. And... Um, what happened that they, they came with, it was a Pembrokeshire cavalry came in. Um, in. In all these wee towns, they got the local school teacher to draw up lists of young men aged 18 to 23. Um, now, the school teachers were damned if they did and damned if they didn't. If they, if they didn't draw up these things, they'd be up before the beak for sedition or something like that. Um, if they did do it, they would probably find their house burnt down. So the school teachers were all running away and, and in a state about this. Anyway, the Pembrokeshire cavalry came up to Trenent to oversee the school teacher drawing up lists of, of boys' names. And they handed in, there was a ha an anti anti conscription letter was handed in. The way they handed in these letters, the signatures were always in a circle. So nobody could be picked out as the ringleader. And, and so that's what they did. But um, there were also, of course, um, demonstrations in the street. This lady, Jackie Crookston, was one of the, the first ones. She was banging a drum and making them all, um, you know, demonstrate against conscription. She was one of the very first shot dead. The, the soldiers started firing, um, but they didn't just fire in the demonstrators. They burst into closes and ran up into people's houses and shot people in their homes. And they shot, the um, one took his sword and ran it through in, in a bed where a child was sleeping, or not sleeping, <laughs> hiding, obviously, and, and cut off the child's finger. They, they ran out then into the fields and they started shooting people at random, nothing to do with the, the demonstrations. Um, a wee boy going to see his teacher, um, a man going to collect his wages from his employer, a, a carter taking a load of hay along, and um, a couple of wee boys that were just kind of running around excitedly looking to see what was happening. Um, people hanging up their washing, all sorts of people. Um, they just fired at random, and of course they were on horseback so they could ride them down. And in the end, 12 people were shot dead, and a whole lot of others wounded. So actually, um, there were nearly as many people killed as were killed at the, battle, at the massacre of Peterloo 20 years later, um, except that it wasn't even just the protesters here that were killed, it was a whole lot of folk 
um, you know, had nothing to do with the demonstrations. So that, that statue is in Trinent. Now, I was over in Trinent a few months ago because I hadn't known about the massacre of Trinent until I, until I, I read a book um, that was published recently. Um, now, there was, there's no plaque in that statue to say what it's about. And I asked a lady who was having her lunch there who said she was from Trinent, she'd gone to school there and everything, and she said she thought it was something to do with the Battle of Preston Pans. So I, I went to the, the local library there. They don't have a tourist information or anything, but I went to the local library, and they were scratching their heads, and, and they said that one pulled out a big book about the First World War, and I said, <laughs> no, <laughs> no. Um, and, and then um, another one got out the Book of Cuttings, and there they found the cutting for when that statue was put up in 1995. But, you know, that's in the village of Trinent, where, I, I, well, I, I must say I don't know anything about Trinent, really, but I would imagine it's not an awful lot happens <laughs> on a regular basis there, you know. And that is in the very town square. So, um, yeah, the, um, the general suppression of the whole, the whole thing goes on, basically. Um, at the same time as this was mainly working class riots, but at the same time there were middle class, um, not exactly riots, but middle class um, agitation and activism. Most of this, this was um, for political reform rather than economic reform. Um, you had a lot of people um, going round setting up reform societies. There were reform societies in um, every town, in a hundred, well, a hundred towns from Wick to Salcoats um, by, by 1793. Now, they were in England as well, but by 1793, Scotland had the same number of reform societies as England, although it only 20% of the population. And in fact, um, the other lot that were being set up was the Friends of the People. The middle classes in Scotland were setting up branches of the Friends of the People who wanted parliamentary reform. They wanted the universal suffrage. I would think from that they actually meant the universal male suffrage, but they, they called it universal suffrage. Parliamentary reform. At this time, um, Glasgow had no MPs at all. And Liverpool, which was a much smaller city, had, had two MPs. So they wanted uh, representation spread a bit better. Mm. And um, so, th so they were setting up Friends of the People Societies. There were Friends of the People Societies in England as well. But they were actually a, a more kind of upper class thing. Uh, they had quite high subscription rates. Um, and, and there was quite a bit of support from the upper, upper classes for, for this kind of um, reform. You had, um, in 1793, Lord Dare wrote to Charles Gray, who was um, a member of the London Friends of the People, and he was later a, a Whig Prime Minister. And Lord Dare wrote to him a long letter saying that Scotland had been treated as a conquered province these two centuries. Had no union ever taken place, we would have been more emancipated than we are. The Friends of Liberty in Scotland have almost unanimously been enemies to the union with England. And then you had the Earl of Lauderdale, Dougal Stewart, went off to revolutionary France and was haranguing a Paris crowd on the subject of liberty. And when he came back to Scotland, he set up pro-revolutionary clubs. And years later, he was named as a member of the Provisional Government of the Scottish Republic. That was the language they used. Um, the most famous of all these kind of middle-class reformers, of course, is Thomas Muir of Hunters Hill, whom probably a lot of you have heard of. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail in him because there's the big um, Friends of Thomas Muir Society, which I think is having some event very soon, and they have them every year. Uh, there's also a Thomas Muir trail. There are Thomas Muir websites. Thomas Muir is, is uh, uh, his CV is completely incredible. I mean, considering that the fastest thing anywhere was a horse, his his travels um, for the revolution covered um, Scotland, Ireland, England, France, and of course he was over to Australia and South America. He, he was all over the place, and. Um, when he was 
charged with sedition. He was tr trying to get support from the English friends of the people. But down there, um, they, uh, they were wanting to... They were, they were now, uh, uh, upset about it, about the, the French wanting to execute their king, and they were wanting to kind of call the revolution off. So Thomas Muir, never in doubt about his power of pr pr persuasion, went off to Paris to try and persuade the revolutionary government not to guillotine the king. Um, I have to say, you probably know by now, he was unsuccessful in that. And of course, um, then if there was war and it was hard for him to get back for his trial, but he got back and he was tried along with five, four others for sedition. And uh, the judge was Lord Braxfield, who had a nice turn of phrase. He used to say things like, hang a, sh hang a thief when he's old. No, hang a thief when he's young and he'll no steal when he's old. And um, Joseph Gerald, who was one of the ones who was um, in the in the dock along with Thomas Muir, pointed out that even our saviour himself had been a reformer. And Lord Braxfield answered, "And muckle he made of that. He was hang it." <laughs> so um, Lord uh, Robert Burns um, at this time was holding down a government job as an exciseman, and he happened to be in, in Edinburgh at the time. And he expressed his radical sympathies in anonymous poems. So the very first day of Thomas Muir's trial, he handed in Scots Wahey that he'd just written to his publisher with a note that, although it appears to be about the Battle of Bannockburn, it's actually a reference to a more recent struggle. And the authorities thought so too, because they banned it right away, and it stayed banned for the next 50 years. So what happens to a banned song? It became an absolute anthem of revolution, not just in Scotland and not just in Ireland, but all over England as well. So much for it being about the Battle of Bannockburn. Um, the, 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 whenever a band played it, they were all arrested for sedition. Um, meanwhile, well, um, who else? We had. Yeah, this is George Mealmaker. I know these pictures aren't necessarily very great, but of course there were no cameras in those days, so quite often we have to make do with caricatures. Um, George Mealmaker, uh, he was again a weaver and he wrote s um, stuff about bad stuff about the government. And he founded the Society of United Scotsmen along. Sorry. Who? Ah. Uh. Yeah, <laughs> um, along the lines of the United, the Society of United Irishmen. So it was actually quite a bit more radical than the Friends of the People. Um, he ended up in Botany Bay as well. Um, so from 1809 until 1812, around 100,000 workers in west of Scotland um, joined illegal trade unions which was risking transportation or worse for themse themselves. Um, that's 100,000. To put it in perspective, the population of the city of Glasgow at this time was 147,000. Although, of course, we're talking... These Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> um, West Central Scotland. Um, yeah. And in 1812, the weavers' wages were again cut. This time, they were cut by 50%. So the weavers went back to the magistrates to get them to restore their wages. And the magistrates did restore them, but the employers simply refused to pay the restored wages. And nothing happened. The employers were in breach of the law at this point, but nothing happened. So the weavers, um, in 1813, come out and strike in a big way, 40,000 of them come out and strike. Now, some of these weavers had been involved way back in 1787, so some of the same weavers, you had this continuous thread of it um, over 26 years. The other interesting thing was that they were supported by Glasgow University students. Now, this happened along in the 20th century, but this is the first instance that I know of of students, um, students marching in common cause with workers for workers' rights. And the other interesting thing is that a lot of these Glasgow University students were the sons of the very employers that the workers were up against. 
Um, so the weavers had the law on their side, but the strikes made the magistrates um, transfer their sympathies to the employers, and they deregulated the wages so that you were back to individual bargaining. Troops were brought in, strikers were struck dead, and the leaders were convicted of con combination conspiracy. In 1816, there was a gathering of about 40,000 at Thrushgrove near Glasgow. Whenever these big gatherings happened, they had to gather on some kind of private land belonging to a supporter. They couldn't gather on somewhere like Glasgow Green that was common land. So this crowd of 40,000 demanded reform, and on their agenda was planning a general strike, forming a Scottish provisional government, printing money for the provisional government to pay for weapons, carrying out military drill regularly on all the village greens, raiding forges and taking metal to make pikes, buying and selling pikes, gunpowder and other weapons, searching houses and commandeering weapons from people who maybe wouldn't voluntarily have given their weapons to the revolution. And villages identified by the authorities as revolutionary hotspots. There's a whole list here, and some of them are today very douce, respectable places, but 300 years ago, it was a different picture. Germiston, Port Dundas, Anderson, Townhead, Camlachie, Carlton, Bridgeton, Toll Cross, Pollock Shaws, Tradeston, Dunmarnock, Mulgai, Dumbarton, Duntocher, Balthron, Kirk and Tillich, Kilsyth, Condorit, Camelin, Falkirk, St Ninians, Dirling, Eldersley, Johnson, Kilbarchen, Neilston, Eaglesham, Beath, Dolry, and Stewarton. But <laughs> the weaving town of Paisley was reported, um, they were very proud that the riot act was read there more often than anywhere else. And in fact, to this day, they have a literary festival. Um, I don't know if it's every year, but certainly have it most years, I think, where the theme is the revolutionary past. So we've got a verbatim account here by John Parkhill of life in Paisley in 1819. He said, training after nightfall, that's military training, of course, became quite common. Officers, if not appointed, were talked of. Pikes, guns and pistols were getting in readiness. And over ab and above the drill, large public meetings added to the general agitation. Whilst the fatal meeting at Manchester, that was the Peterloo massacre, was a culminating plan in the insurrectionary movement. Our drilling got bris brisker than ever. And when news of the Peterloo massacre reached Clyde side, 16,000 gathered in Paisley in sympathy. Uh, you actually wonder how these people made these big gatherings because the vast majority of them wouldn't have access to a horse. So all of them would be going from town to town on Shanks Boney. Burns's band song, Scots Were Here, was played to the crowd. Ooh, hmm? Is it all right? Right. So the authorities stepped up their mobilisation against the radicals at this point. Um, now, individuals with landed interests, including people that you wouldn't really have expected to get involved in this, Walter Scott, um, he set up his own private uh, pro-government army to fight with the, the paramilitaries in the streets. The editor of the Glasgow Herald, he set up a, an army of a thousand people, decked them all out in uniforms, and they were called the Glasgow Sharpshooters, and they went around shooting the pa or, or getting into fights anyway with the paramilitaries. Um, on March the 21st, 1820, a committee for organising a provisional government met in a Gallagate pub. They sought better employment conditions, better wages and, uh, for, for workers and weavers generally. Also, the universal male suffrage and parliamentary reform and according to James Mitchell, who was um, the chief of um, police, the police commander of Glasgow, and he was there in an undercover role as a police spy, he wrote to the politicians that they also wanted Scottish independence. And when the meeting ended, the committee members were all secretly arrested as they came out the door. 
But despite the fact that they were on jail, on April the 1st, leaflets and placards were distributed in the name of the jailed committee, urging a general strike on the 3rd of April and an armed uprising on the 5th of April. So on the 3rd of April, in response to the leaflets, 60,000 people come out and strike. Not just weavers, it was a general strike, all trades. Now, um, the, the, well, the authorities deployed soldiers, in, in answer to the strike, the authorities deployed soldiers throughout Glasgow. There were battalions situated in, these, these are all familiar street names to us, you know, and, and you just picture it 200 years ago, brimming with soldiers. Battalions were in Eglinton Street, the Gallagate, St. Enos Square, St. Vincent Street. There were artillery were deployed at the Clyde Bridges and four further battalions were summoned. Um, when we talk about the Scottish 1820 uprising, we refer to two separate events in two consecutive days. Now, the signal for the revolution to start in um, West Central Scotland was supposed to be the non-arrival of the London mail coach. It was supposed to not arrive because the radicals at Carlisle were supposed to stop it. Unfortunately for the radicals, it did turn up in Glasgow at the normal time without a hair out of place. So this um, turned uh, most of the most of the would-be radicals, would-be re rebels, decided to um, live to fight another day and, and called the whole thing off. <coughs> However, a few still wanted to go ahead with it, and they were. Um, urged on by government agent provocateurs, of course, who were trying to flush out the people who were keenest in the revolution, the leaders. Um, a government agent called Duncan Turner assembled a revolutionary group in Fir Park, um, the, the present-day Glasgow necropolis in Deniston. And um, he said, you know, they should go on with they should march to Condorit, he said, because in Condorit there were a whole lot of other revolutionaries waiting to, to set off, so you could join them there. And um, he, unfortunately, had to go and, and run a revolution somewhere else. But, you know, if they go to Condorit, they'll find John Baird there, and, and, and he could lead them too. So Andrew Hardy, who was a 26-year-old weaver with military service, most of these... Um, most of these... Uh, armed revolutionaries had military service as well as the paramilitary training they'd been doing. So Andrew Hardy, um, he is supposed to have done a thing like at the Alamo, he drew a line in, uh, in the earth and said, people who want to go with the revolution, come here with me, and if you want to go home, just the other side of the line. So in the end, 30 people followed him, marching from Royston over to Condorit. And they arrived at Condorit, and there they met John Baird, who had a bunch of people, not an awful lot of people, with him. Um, he'd been expecting a great horde coming from Glasgow, and that's what he'd been told. So he wanted to call the whole thing off. But there was a, a government agent called John King in among his men who said, oh, no, 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 if we, if we just go on to, to Camelin, to Falkirk, um, the car and iron works, that's where they're all assembling, you know, to get their... their pikes and guns and things, so if we just go on there. So they did march on, and they marched on till they came to Bonnie Muir. And when they got to the field of Bonnie Muir, they rested there, and John King said he would go off and um, bring some reinforcements from Camelin. Um, so he went off, but what he actually brought, of course, was a bunch of soldiers. And when the radicals saw them coming, um, they let out a shout, and they did what they'd been trained to do in military training. When you're infantry with a lot of cavalry charging towards you, you're supposed to form yourself into a square, because this allegedly spooks the horses, and the horses don't really know what side to attack. So that's what they did. But in this occasion, it didn't work. And when they saw they were all still charging down, they ran and they hid behind this dike, which is known to this day as the Radical Dyke. It's still in Bonnie Muir Battlefield, which is now just a farmer's field. Um, it's now got a wee plaque on it. Just recently, comparatively recently, the 1820 Society got permission to put a plaque 
on the on the gate of it. Um, and, and the radical dike is still there. So they hid behind there, but um, of they were outmanned, outgunned, out everything, and 18 of them were taken prisoner, and the rest ran away. Um, now we move to the very next day, to Straven, the action moves. Now, this man was a very interesting man, James Purley Wilson. He was the inventor of pearl knitting. He was a, a weaver and a hosier. He was also um, a, a part-time dentist, a part-time surgeon. He um, mended clocks and guns, although he was supposed to be a very peaceable man also, but he had a long history of um, demonstrations and political agitation. He used to, right from the 1780s, 90s, so again, he's, he'd been a long trail of doing all these things. Um, he was um, said to carry a banner, which ca said on it, Scotland free or a desert, desert, spelt desert. Um, and he also wrote satirical verse. Uh, the, the weavers were, uh, I don't know if I mentioned, the weavers were known as poets. Um, they, they were, that was one of the, the hobbies. The weavers were very involved in writing satirical verses. Some people thought it was because of sitting beside their looms that went clickety, 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 clickety all the time, and they could. That's one theory anyway, but they wrote a lot of it. Um, but why the authorities were really down on him was because his house was a centre, a rendezvous for all the radicals to come regularly and discuss. Um, political issues of the time. Not necessarily stuff that affected them, like weaver's wages, but also stuff like the abolition of the corn laws, abolition of, of slavery, stuff that um, the authorities, well, generally the authorities did not want the working classes to be interested in politics at all. So they had, they had their sights on him. And he was persuaded to walk with 25 men towards Kathkin, where he was told the revolution was definitely starting off. But when they reached East Colbride, they were told there was no revolution happening out there. Instead, what was there was a band of soldiers. So they turned about without firing a shot and went back to their homes. They'd now, of course, been identified, and the soldiers came and stormed into their homes and arrested 10 of them. So over that summer, um, 88 men were um, charged with high treason in, in West Central Scotland. And the prisoners were held at Edinburgh, Edinburgh Castle, Paisley and Greenock Jail. And there were angry mobs and battles with the hussars everywhere. Men, women and children were wounded and killed. Um, in Greenock... In Greenock, they succeeded in springing five of the political prisoners from Greenock jail, but at quite a bad price because the soldiers fired dis indiscriminately into the crowd and killed eight of them. Um, the, this um, memorial that's in Greenock now, it shows a child's hand in the hand of an old person, and that's to uh, let people remember that the youngest civilian shot dead that time was a child of eight, and the oldest was in their 60s. So, um, a wee word here about high treason. Um, the, the laws of high treason had never really been integrated into Scots law. They'd been hurriedly imported um, at the time of the um, Treaty of Union in 1707, but they'd never been put into practice in Scotland. During previous rebellions, like the two Jacobite rebellions, all the people that were being charged with high treason were taken south of the border to be, to be tried. But this time, they did it a different way. They set up um, secret courts in Ayr, Dumbarton, Paisley, Glasgow, and Stirling, and indicted all the accused under English law with um, the, the imported English judges and English prosecuting lawyers up to carry out under English law, and they used 12-man juries instead of 15-man juries, which is, is supposed to be under Scots law. Now, these trials must have been something else. Each trial 
lasted without a break from 10 in the morning until midnight. And the only person allowed a candle was the judge. So after the, ca the sun went down, everybody else was kind of creeping around in the dark. And lawyers' speeches could last five hours. Reading out the in indictment against James Wilson took two hours because every single banned piece of literature that he'd read was, was um, the title of it was read. And to give you an idea of the scurrilous stuff he was reading, one of them was the Manchester Guardian. Um, at, at that time, it was called the Manchester Observer. So um, the, uh, one of the other courts, there was nearly a, a duel between the defence lawyer and the, the prosecuting lawyer because the defence lawyer challenged the, the right of the prosecuting lawyer to practice in a Scottish court, and it, 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 and then it was challenged to a duel. But the but the the judge um, poured oil in the troubled waters and settled that down. So um, in the James Wills? Right, yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, the jurors were reluctant to bring in a guilty verdict. They um, they they brought back not guilty verdicts, first of all, and the judge sent them back with increasing anger, telling them to find a, 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 a verdict that was acceptable to him. And finally, they came with this um, kind of doubtful sort of verdict, finding him guilty of compassing to levy war against the king in order to compel him to change his measures. Uh, but they put in a plea for clemency, and the judge ignored that. Now, all the accused, um, although 88 guys were charged with high treason, only something like 50-odd actually stood trial because the rest somehow escaped or were sprung from jail or something. Um, and all of these people were originally under the draconian the threat of the draconian sentence which uh, for high treason which was hanging drawing and quartering for a man for a woman it was burning at the stake but there weren't actually any women on this occasion so um the three people who were sentenced to death in the end were um james Purley wilson and john baird and andrew hardy uh, but the judge commuted the sentence from hanging, drawing, and quartering to being beheaded. No, sorry, hanged. And then once they really were dead, having their heads cut off. Deca posthumous decapitation is a, a weird thing, but that's what, that's what they're sentenced to. Um, James Wilson um, made an, an impassioned speech of over 250 words, which was constantly interrupted by the judge. And I'll just give you a wee sample of what he said. Remember, this is a man with, very, you know, not very much formal education. You may condemn me to immolation on the scaffold, but you cannot degrade me. If I've appeared as a pioneer in the violent of freedom's battles, if I've attempted to free my country from political degradation, my conscience tells me I've only done my duty. Your brief authority will soon cease but the vindictive proceedings this day shall be recorded in history. The judge warned the press who were present to use their discretion in reporting this speech, and um, the Glasgow Herald commented the next day, he stammered out a few words in an incoherent manner. When it came to his execution, there was an angry crowd of 20,000 gathered in Glasgow Green, and the authorities mobilised the greatest display of military force ever attending a, a Scottish execution. There were loads of soldiers with bristling guns, bayonets, whatever, and the angry crowd hurling in insults at the soldiers and murder and stuff like this. The regular handman had refused to have anything to do with cutting off heads, so they hired a, a, a medical student from Glasgow University who'd some experience in cutting up bodies. Um, his name was Thomas Young, and he said he would cut off the heads for 40 pounds or 40 guineas, 40 guineas, pounds, guineas probably, um, which was double the usual fee that the hangman got. So um, he did um, cut off, um, he cut off Wilson's head, and then he galloped to, um, or, or was taken somehow to Stirling, where he did the same for Baird and Hardy. 
after that, <laughs> he was an unpopular man, and in fact, he had to give up his studies and flee to Ireland. And the last we hear of him was letters he was sending to the authorities from Ireland, pleading with them to please give him his 40 guineas fee, which th they hadn't paid him till then. Maybe he got it by now, I don't know. So these were the last ever beheadings in the UK. If you want to see um, Thomas Young's cloak and axe, it's still on display at the Smith Museum Stirling, where it was put, well, maybe not, Exactly, immediately after, but, but of course, that's where the, the, the cloak and axe ended up after he cut off the heads of Beard and Hardy. Um, so let's look at the, the monument on Site Hill in a wee bit more detail. Um, this is a little known monument. I know um, John McCallion, who was a, used to be a Labour politi politician, said he lived right beside it. I think Gil Patterson, who was also, he was an SNP politician, they lived right beside it, used to play in the cemetery all the time and never knew that that, that monument was there. Um, it was initially uh, um, set up for Baird and Hardy. Wilson's body had been, the very night after he was executed, his body was taken away by his um, niece and his daughter and reburied in the family lair at Straven. So he's, he lies there to this day. Um, th this, the, the supporters um, put up the money for this monument, and at that time, Site Hill Cemetery didn't belong to the city corporation. It belonged to um, a, a supporter. It was private ground, so, so he let them put it there. And they asked the authorities if they could go up to um, Stirling and dig up Beard and Hardy and rebury them under there. And they were told they could, except... Um, yeah, <laughs> it had to be under conditions of secrecy. This was as far ahead as 1847. They'd all been pardoned and everything, um, and but that was that was um, the express condition. The removal from the bodies and the reburying should happen without any public notice, intimation, without any procession or concourse, attendance of presence, people, the presence of a few friends only. So they were suppressing the story of it still then. Um, also on the stat also on the monument, um, we've got a list which was comparatively recently put on by the 1820 Society. Um, this is a list of the 19 transportees. Now, of the 50 odd people that, that stood trial, quite a lot of them were plea bargained away, um, either got off with it or found not guilty, or ended up just doing their sentence somewhere in Scotland. Some of them were government agents, and, and the, the government paid their fines for them. Um, but 19 were transported to Botany Bay. Now, we know um, how they got on because of this wee book, un unfortunately out of print now, which was written by, um, the descend by Alistair McFarlane, who was a descendant of Thomas McFarlane there. Um, he... Um, went out. Thomas McFarlane's one of the three who actually come back that we know of from the, the, the transportees. And Alison McFarlane emigrated to uh, Australia, met a lady called Margaret, who was a, an Australian historian, and they got married, and they wrote um, that book which did research and followed up all the transportees who ended up in Australia. And they all did very, very well. They, they, did, um, they were all literate, they were all um, politically aware and everything. And, um, well, actually, as regards getting ahead in life, they, they had quite a head start because it was actually quite a low bar, the average lot of people that were out in Botany Bay at the time. So um, so they, they became um, businessmen, farmers, school teachers. One of them became the town constable. Um, and the three who came back were Thomas McCulloch, um, his descendant, Nia McCulloch, she's an Australian lady, but she comes backwards and forwards to Scotland with the 1820 Society doing, doing research in, into the whole affair. Thomas McFarlane, um, the, the ancestor of, of Ar Alistair McFarlane, and the third person who came back was Andrew White. Andrew White came back um, and he, um, when he died of 
um, natural causes in the Royal Infirmary, he put in a request to be buried beside his old comrades Baird and Hardy under the monument. So he's the third radical who lies under there. And um, some of the radicals actually wrote home saying it's actually really good out here in Australia. <laughs> Lovely weather. Um, th th well, the, um, th they said things like, one of them said, respectable people are in very scarce commodity here, so if you come out, we'll, we'll definitely do very well here. So um, some, of, some of the family, I think, managed to come out one way or another. Alan Murchie was famous for writing a whole lot of and not just him, I think quite a few of them. They were, they were months in jail waiting for a boat um, to take them to Australia, and Alan Murchie and, and others wrote a whole lot of songs and verses that they were all singing in jail together, um, all about their exploits, what might happen to them in Australia, what they were hoping, all, all this stuff. Um, so, yeah. So, um, oh yes, there's also... We wouldn't know anything about it, about the whole radical wars, if it weren't for this man here, Seamus Markagovin. Um, he and Peter Beresford Ellis wrote this book, The Scottish Insurrection of 1820. This is actually a second edition. That there was an original hardback edition published in 1970, which was the 150th anniversary. They researched everything about the radical wars and wrote that book. And um, when Seamus McAgovin died, his ashes got interred there beside the memorial. So he's got a wee headstone there beside the memorial. So how is it we remember the radical wars? Well, if we look at the Peterloo Massacre and the Tall Puddle Martyrs, um, the Peterloo Massacre was a big blockbuster film recently. The Tall Puddle Martyrs, um, there was a television drama about them a few years ago. There's a big museum down in Dorset. There's festivals celebrating both events. There's um, na um, street names in England and Australia named after the Tall Puddle Martyrs. And bear in mind the Tall Puddle Martyrs, none of them were actually in danger of their lives. None of them were accused of high treason. They were accused of conspiracy and swearing oaths. And um, five of them went off to, were sent to Australia, but they were back within, most of them were back within a few years. So it was actually quite a, a, a small affair compared to all these radical wars with so many people killed in the, in the streets, apart from everywhere else. The, um, the radical wars are remembered with, the, there's the monument in Straven, monument in Sight Hill, and in Paisley is another, all done in the 1840s, 1860s. Um, there's uh, basically, it's individual enthusiasts that keep alive the memory of the radical wars. Um, that's the 1820 Society carrying out one of their commemoration services. Um, I'm seeing runs annual commemoration services, but actually the committee are getting pretty elderly now, and the pandemic kind of put the Peter in quite a lot of it, so I don't really know what the future holds for the 1820 Society. Um, th in the likes of the People's Palace, you might think you would get some references to the Radical Wars. There's two pictures by um, Ken Curry, but they're very stylized pictures to do with the Radical Wars. It's... Um, and then there's a list of everybody who was hanged in Glasgow Green with their crimes beside them. And James Wilson is there with high treason beside him. Everybody else is, is either a murderer or a, or a thief. He's got high treason beside him. But there's no context given. There's no, no um, reference to what this actually means or, or, or why, why he ended up with that. Um, and in 2001... Um, when we just newly got Scottish Parliament. And again, this February, there have been debates in the Scottish Parliament about whether um, Scottish history should be taught in, a, in a, a more structured way with special reference to the radical wars. In fact, the, the one that was just in February there, it was a member of the 18 society, 1820 Society that got his MSP to put it forward. Unfortunately, um, the, the, the member of the 1820 Society died two days before the debate took place, which was very sad. But anyway, the, the, the two debates took place, but they were just 
private members' bills. There was no vote taken. As far as we can see, nothing came of it at all. So as to whether the veil of secrecy <laughs> and now really neglect will ever be lifted from the radical wars, um, I guess you could say the jury is still out in that. So... Um, I don't know if any of you have, have any questions you want to ask or anything or Are there any books that we can read more about? Yeah, well, um, I mentioned this, the Scottish insurrection of 1820. Um, this one about the Scottish radicals out of print. Um, Kenny McCaskill wrote a book recently um, called Radical Scotland, which is where I found out about the massacre of Trinent because he also gives the, the kind of East Coast with him being an Edinburgh um, politician. Um, and um, Maggie Craig wrote a book called um, One Week in 1820, I think it's called. Um, and and, and that's, that's mainly about the kind of end of it, you know, the Battle of Bonnie Muir, the bit around the Battle of Bonnie Muir, but actually the, the, the whole thing, um, as I say, comes right from the, the 1780s. Um, I should mention, in Abercrombie Street Cemetery, the, the Carlton Cemetery, there are plaques um, about the radical weavers, the, the Carlton weavers that got shot in, 18, in, in 1787, but you can't read them anymore. They're totally weathered, everything. The writing's just gone. It's been there so long. Um, the, eight, the 1820 Society themselves produced these wee books, um, which you just kind of give out for a donation. That, and there may be a wee bit out of date now. We've possibly found a wee bit more about the radical thing since, since it's mainly just about the 1820. Um, um, I think that's the main sources. Um, yeah, Maggie Craig's was One Week in April, is the name of her book. And um, yeah, Radical Scotland by Kenny McCaskill. And, and the, main, the main book is this, this big one here. There have been a few more books produced recently. Um, there was the, the 200th anniversary recently and they were going to have a big, all sorts of things happening then, but of course the pandemic came in and that was the end of that. Do we have any other questions? Uh-huh. Oh, right. Uh-huh. I can be seen at the United Head uh, Regional Office in West Regent Street by appointment of probably the Norman Kent, who's the brand secretary. But the centre panel shows the radicals in Bonnie Muir <laughs> been attacked oh, right. uh, by soldiers. It's, it's in an oil. Oh, that's great. So when was it that that was that connection? I could okay. guess the date. I, the day, I think it was done in the 80s. Right. Series. Uh -huh. It's on display in the union office mm -hmm. as we speak today. In fact, your colleague, your late friend Molly, yeah. gave the banner to them. Oh, you? right, so yes. Yeah, Willie yeah, really Douglas always had a lot of the banners and everything. So yeah, it's now back in the Union office for display. Right, that's Anybody good. wishes to see a wee mm -hmm. bit about it. Thank you. Any other questions? Any other ones more? Um, I should say it's also thanks to Mary that um, Radical Garden Preservation Trust has been uh, working on a project called My Historic Neighbourhood um, at the moment, um, and we have been working with four schools, four, four primary schools in Psych Health, um, and an organisation called Culture Junction, um, and they broke down the history of the Radical Wars with Mary into, I think, 18 phrases, and then the young people um, acted out each phrase, and then they came together at the end and had a, a rich history of the Radical Wars. Um, and not one of them, nor any of the teachers, had actually heard of this history. Um, and obviously the one in the was right there on the doorstep. Yeah. And it was really encouraging. Um, lots of them were like, oh, I'm going to take my granddad and leave home. And make sure that they're going to uh, go past it. And then another part of the project was that they um, were encouraged to decorate stones. Um, and just, you know, getting them to think of what the changes they wanted to see in the future for, for their community. Um, so I think there's you know, so much um, appetite for that, and I think you know, we could probably revisit it and do a dedicated project um, just on the radical war. So thank you. Yeah, yeah.
Thank you all for joining us. This is the last event before it's open to festival, so I hope that um, you've enjoyed the, the festival this year and you can catch all the talks um, on our YouTube channel. I need to update the names of them because it's probably called streaming something at the moment, but they'll all be on the um, YouTube channel. Okay, thank you everyone.